there. Glad you could join us today. Um, it is. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'll tell you what, we're going to talk a little bit about the Indiana Historical Society. We're going to tell a story or two, do some visiting, and listen to some Orange County fiddle playing. So I'm going to go freshen up my tea, and why don't you join us up here on the porch? Neighbor Tom, I'm always glad when you stop by to visit here um, on the porch, and um, I just always enjoy it. And I was just thinking, can I tell you a story? Okay, well, let me tell you one. You know, I ran for governor in 2016, and there's some rules on all about when you can raise money. And the first day of May 2015, I could start raising money. And I come home that day, and my wife opens up a letter from a guy named Claude Johnson in Crawfordsville. Check for $10. Claude says, I'm retired and I'm older, but I can't send you $500, but I can send $10 once a week from now to the election. Got me here, got Lisa and I both. So over time, I told this story and I got to meet Claude Johnson. Not only did I get to meet Claude Johnson, Claude's no longer with us, the Lord's called him home, but I had the honor of uh, when Claude, uh, they had a dinner with, in Crawfordsville with about 20 of their leading citizens, and they invited me to come up to it. And it was out at the Crawfordsville Country Club. And Claude was not long for the world then, but he was a colorful character. He had owned a big insurance business. He collected World War I artifacts, and he was well-read and lived in this really cool, cool home with a neat fireplace, and he collected and bought old fire trucks, over 30 of them, sent down to Mexico to communities that didn't have them. Really quite a philanthropist. Well, it's this night of this dinner, and they've got 20 people. They've got the head of the hospital. They've got the head of the school corporation. They've got the president of the country club, and they're all going around the table, and Claude's telling a story on each one of them, just a short one. I'm the last person they come to. And I'm sitting there, and Claude says, I don't know what to tell you about this guy. This is John Gregg, and you all know him. He said, um, John and I have become friends the last three years, and he's kept in touch with me since the election. But I want you all to know, this man not getting elected, this was a mistake. And I'm thinking, oh my. And he said, he's one of two people in my lifetime that I know where voters made the wrong choice. It's just wrong that they didn't elect him. And he's going on, and I'm feeling embarrassed and a little inhibited. And um, he just goes on and on, and knowing he's not well. So finally he's done, and he just takes a breath. And, you know, he said just nothing but nice things about me. So I lean back, and Claude, thank you for those kind words. I said, tell me, who was the other person that the voters turned down that should have been elected? He said, why, it was me when I ran for Mayor Crawfordsville. So um, they tell you in law school, never ask a question unless you know the answer. I learned it the hard way there. Well, I'm glad you joined us here on the porch today. We've got... Uh, Jody Blankenship, back to Indiana, back to the Midwest, the head, I like to use the term head, sure. of the Indiana Historical Society. Yeah, thank you for having me. Well, we're glad you're here. Tell me, I'm a history major, love history more than politics. If we were talking to some young high school students, mm -hmm. tell them the importance and the value of history. Well, the important value of history is it gives us some sense of who we are, where we came from. The future is unknown, right? We cannot predict the future. So all we have is the past. Luckily for us, there's a, a saying I've always picked up, and it's uh, times change and people don't. We're very predictable. Oh, that's good. And so when we look at the past, we can often see examples of how we are likely to react to things. 
Now the context will change in the modern sense, but typically people do very similar things. So it's a great guide to help us when we think about the issues that we're dealing with today, it gives us a sense of how we got to this point and when we have dealt with things similarly in the past to help us make better, more informed decisions. Wow, that's good. I, uh, I, I do enjoy it. And I know you got her. You've worked in some really rich states history-wise, Connecticut, Ohio, Kentucky, here. You just keep moving, moving west. and. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's just been some wonderful things. Um, tell me, if somebody wants to join, because I know you have membership, mm -hmm. let's talk about the important things, because how's the historical society funded, and how can you join and help? Because anybody can join it. Oh, anybody can okay. join it. Yes, we are a private nonprofit, so we rely on income from our endowment, admission fees and sales in our gift shop or a cafe, and the generosity of our donors and members. So you can join the IHS very simply by going to indianahistory.org and you'll see a big button that says join. Click that button, fill out the form, and you become a member. And when you're a member of the IHS, you get free admission to the building, Ooh. free parking, um, you get uh, our In Perspective magazine, our Traces magazine, our Connections magazine, and discounts on our programs and services throughout the state. Well, I have always enjoyed your, your magazines, and I know you have so many wonderful exhibits, and they change all the time, but I know you've had a, well, an exhibit um, very near and dear to those of us here in the Wabash Valley, Eva Kaur. One yep. time you had one of Eva and the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, what, what else do you see, some of the exhibits that have just really impressed you and have been a real, real crowd pleasers and educational? Well, we've had a number of them. So as you say, Eva Kaur, that one we were so excited to do because as you know, Eva died on July 4th, 2019. We were getting ready to induct her into our Indiana legends. And so her son came and represented her and we struck up a friendship and he decided to donate her personal records to the IHS. Wonderful. I mean, Eva is certainly from this area, well known, loves this place, but really, I would say is an international figure. Absolutely. You know, the idea that um, I had read, because I love history, I had read all about the Holocaust, read about Dr. Joseph Mengele, mm -hmm. only to find years later as an adult when I'm in the legislature, I meet a twin who that fiend had um, operated on and, um, and hurt and did damage, did damage to. Just amazing, um, some, some of those things. I know recently there have been... Um, some uh, tour all across the country of different documents that mm -hmm. have helped shape America. Yeah. What are some of those? Well, so we're really excited to have that exhibit, and that collection is going to stay at the IHS. Oh. So we worked with a nonprofit to bring it from Texas to Indianapolis. It has 1,557 documents that are fundamental to the shaping of Western democratic systems. So. A Magna Carta from 1350. Oh, really? One of St. Augustine's, his Confessions and City of God from 1610, one of the first times it was published in English. My lands. Now, was this Magna Carta, was this one back from Runnymede and when the king signed it? Or a little after that, little after? maybe about a century later. What but I like to tell kids Because I didn't in. remember the exact year. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I hope Dr. Madison isn't listening to this. Okay. Well, you know, we, we like to think about books today as I'll go on Amazon, I'll yeah. buy it, it'll arrive two days later, it cost me a couple bucks. Back then, these things were handmade. So this Magna Carta is handwritten, hand illustrated on vellum, which is a, a tanned animal skin. It would have taken the, um, the bookmaker about nine months to create, and it would have cost similar to what we'd pay for a car today. So wow. this was a cherished item. But think about this, this detailed the rights of the barons and the king. It started saying that people, maybe not everybody at this time, but other people than the king have rights that cannot be impeded on. It's, it's those really early documents that define what is democracy, that the people have rights. How do you answer, because you got, you got here two guys, two male, yep. both white, 
we live in a day and age now, and like you said, that gave certain rights and freedoms to just a small group of people. Mm -hmm. And our country, you know, our country did not recognize Native Americans, African Americans, uh, women did not have rights. Um, how do you go about dealing, uh, dealing with that when you say, look, here's a document that created freedom when it did for some, but not for others? How do you right. explain that? Well, like I was telling you earlier, when we look at history as a roadmap for where we're going, our history is one that has always pushed toward the arc of freedom and equality. We're not there. Mm. We're not there by a long shot. But when we look at how certain people, even though it wasn't everybody, fought for freedom, achieved that freedom yeah. and equality, that is a way that those who don't have that right now, or those in power who have kept people out of that, can begin to look at that history and start to see how it has uh, uh, changed and, and what are the methods that people have used effectively? What methods have we not used effectively? And that creates a roadmap for people to continuously push for more freedom, more equality. Wow, that's a good thought. I want you to hold that. We're going to talk more about that. I really like that expression you made of that arc, that arc of freedom. And the more we go, the more freedom we have and the more freedom we, we see. Uh, Indiana has a connection of freedom with a Catholic university that we know as Notre Dame, uh, Jesuit school, mm -hmm. and the Knights of Ku Klux Klan. What's the story on it? Yeah, so in 1924, the KKK decided to have a rally in South Bend. And this was an interesting moment in time because, of course, we think of the KKK as being a group that doesn't like African Americans. But at this time, they didn't like a lot of people. They didn't like Catholics. <laughs> didn't like they didn't themselves. Like Jews. Yeah, uh, they, yeah they were a very limited yeah. group. So now they decide to hold a rally in South Bend. And of course, Notre Dame, uh, the University of Notre Dame du Lac, which is a French university in a predominantly Eastern European town, Lots of Catholics, a lot of Jewish folks, they're gonna hold a rally there. And so what happened at this time, and we're getting ready to do an exhibit on this in 2020, end of 2023, early 2024, we, the students were justifiably upset about this, right? A group is coming to town, they don't like you. They're saying you shouldn't be here, you need to get out. And so as this Klan rally starts to happen and it's, it's coming to town, the uh, president of Notre Dame, the priest, tells the students, and we have the documents that say this, stay in your rooms, don't engage, leave it alone. And so our exhibit is going to put you in the place of these students in a dorm room, as you would have been at this time, and it's going to ask you to think about what would you have done, because you could stay in your dorm room and do nothing, as you were told, and quite frankly, maybe a responsible decision. You could go home. Or you can do what other students did, and they went downtown to the train station, told those Klan members, oh yeah, the rally's just down that way, down a dark alley, <laughs> roughed them up a little bit. <laughs> well, we all know uh, Indiana's sad history with the Klan, D.C. Stevenson, uh, Madge Oberholzer, that whole uh, horrible, horrible story. I know you're going to be changing those exhibits. Chuck Taylor, Indiana, what? Yes. you got to have basketball. Tell, them, tell me a little about that. Yeah, well, as you know, and we all know, basketball is just synonymous with the identity of Indiana. So one of our favorite sons is Chuck Taylor, the famous tennis shoes tennis that we shoes. see so often. Yep. Uh, so with the NBA All-Star Game coming to town, we thought it would be a great time to really tell the story of one of our hometown people, and that is Chuck Taylor from Columbus, Ohio. So this exhibit is gonna take a look really at basketball across the state by taking people to different gymnasiums in the small towns, big cities, oh, wow. as Chuck Taylor went around to sell his shoe. And we get to explore why Indiana and basketball are so important together. Well, they are synonymous. You know, here in Sanborn, if we left here and went to the community building, 
Town's only got 350 people. Mm -hmm. The community building on the north wall, we only won one sectional, but it says Sanborn Blue Jays, sectional champs, 1957. Yeah. So basketball is about everything in Indiana. Jody, I just handed you some questions here. Our staff's prepared some questions on Indiana history. So we're going to go back and forth and test our knowledge of it. So my first question to you is, and this is a pretty easy one, what is the state's motto? That's a great question. I think I see it every time I cross the border. Is it the crossroads of America? The crossroads of America, absolutely. Well, good for you. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you one that's a little harder than that. What is Indiana's original county? Knox County, right? You got Where Sanborn it. is, Vincennes. Yes. County seat, absolutely. Good, it covered the whole state. Somehow we, we lost that deal too. Okay, this is a little tougher. I don't know if I could have answered it fully. What date, year, day, and date, did Indiana become a state? Well, that would be Statehood Day, December 11th, 1816. You're good. I could have said 1816. I don't know if I could have known that. You're good. Okay. We got to know some of these questions when you run well, the Indiana Historical do. Society. I served in the legislature with a guy named Pat Bauer who was in Indiana when they got statehood. <laughs> <laughs> he was that old, yeah. Well, this one I think is a little tough as well. What county was established last? Oh, it's Northwest. I'll give you a hint. There's a famous uh, scientist who's related to an apple. Newton County. You got Newton it. Newton County, yes, all the way up in the region. Okay, how many stars are there in the Indiana state flag? Oh gosh, I know I'm gonna get this one wrong, but I wanna say it's 19. You're right. Do you know where it was designed, the guy lived that designed it? It's pretty easy, because if you drive down Highway 67 out of Indianapolis, and you come to this town, there's a great big torch that oh uh, is a gosh. piece of art. That's a good question. It's, it's the blanking. home of Gray's Cafeteria. I haven't been there yet. <sighs> well, you don't like fried chicken and pie. That's why, you're, <laughs> that's why you don't have all this. Mooresville. Mooresville, yes. Absolutely, uh. absolutely. Yep, yep. What else you got there? All right. In what year did the Indiana General Assembly adopt the state flag? Boy, I, 1937. Oh, close. 1917. 1917, okay. Name our two constitutions. What years? That would be maybe 18, 18, 19. And then I want to say 2000, or not 2000, sorry, 19, well, I hate to tell you, it was 1816. When we 1816, state, that's right. And then the second was in 1851. We went bankrupt uh, from a lottery financing, uh, financing uh, canals. And of course, the train came along <laughs> in the 1830s, <laughs> so those canals kind of went the same way as a rotary dial telephone. See, so, one of the great things about working at the Indiana Historical Society, when I don't know a question like that, I can call one of my curators. They know it right away. Pick it right up. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Which president signed the Congressional Resolution admitting Indiana to the Union? Uh, December 1816. Have to be Madison. You got it. All right. What's the state stone? Oh, my gosh. Limestone. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Due to its location on the Blue River, what town sits in both Crawford and Harrison counties? I only know this because I've canoed there many times and I got a buddy who lives down there named Denny Oxley. And that's Milltown, home you of the old it. Milltown Millers basketball team. Very good. You know what the state fossil is? It is a mastodon. 
mastodon. It is a mastodon. I could also make comments about other people that are older than me <laughs> saying that, but it's a mastodon. I don't remember one of them in the zoo, but yeah. <laughs> well, who was Indiana's first governor? Mm, Jonathan Jennings, and he was real young, like 30, and sadly, he was an alcoholic, which yeah. was sad, and he was found, supposedly, face down in a gutter when he died. He had a tough life after oh. governor and all, but uh, if you see his picture, it's at the state house. It's in, it might even be in Governor Holcomb's office. He's a young, youthful looking mm. guy. He was just like 31 or 32, and he, they named Jennings County in that North yeah. Vernon area after him. Yeah, state flower. My last question for you. State flower? I don't know anything about And it's not gold medal or Pillsbury. It would be peony. You're good. You're good. All I couldn't right. have guessed that one. My last one for you. Who was the 109th Indiana House Speaker? <laughs> uh, I would guess that would have to be me. Is why they ask it. Yeah. That is yeah. correct. Well, thank you. Well, we sure appreciate you. Why don't you hang around for a little bit? We've got some good Orange County music coming up. So just stick here with us on the porch. Well, we're glad you came back to join us here on the porch. And we've got with us the director of Traditional Arts Indiana, John Kay. John, you're my new best friend, is all I can say about that. Who's our musical guest today? Well, we're really lucky today. We've got Stephen and Nancy Dickey from over in Orange County, down near Paoli. They live down on Grease Gravy Road, and they really just do a great job of playing traditional music. Stephen is the son of Lotus Dickey, a legendary fiddler from southern Indiana. And they continue to play jams and concerts and stuff all over Orange County and have really inspired a whole new generation of people to play. I'm just excited to have them here with us. Thank Why don't you play us one, Stephen? Okay. had a great visit this time here on our show 
We'd like to thank you, Jody, for joining us here on the porch. Professor, Traditional Arts Indiana, thank you for coming and bringing our guest. Got to ask you this question. Tell me, Miss Nancy, how close are you to Pumpkin Center? Well, we're about six miles from Pumpkin Center, maybe uh, maybe even a mile more, but right past the Amish community. Okay, I know where that is. Love Orange County. How close are you to Valine? Well, as the crow flies, we're four miles south. Ooh, pretty pretty close then. Well, I've been to your, I've been close by. Well, tell me something, Stephen. What are you going to play here? I'm going to play Over the Ways Waltz. This is an old time waltz. My dad, he loved this song, and he's wanted to talk to me, talk, taught it to me uh, probably 70 years ago. Well, That's a long time. That is a long time. Well, folks, let me share with you. We live in an imperfect world, and it gets pretty tough. So this week, if you see somebody that looks like they're having a tough time, give them a smile. Maybe the only one they get. Thank you. 